The next speaker is Deborah Goldberg, who is with Earth Justice. Um, so come on up and join us. So thank you uh, very much for having me. I'm hoping my computer actually will boot up, but if it doesn't, I'll do my best to remember what I was going to say. Um, I, uh, as um, as it said, uh, am a lawyer with Earth Justice. Um, so I'm in a slightly different position than the first speaker. I'm not a governmental employee. What I've mostly been doing is suing governmental employees, um, government agencies. And I've been involved in three, a couple of different pipeline matters. Um, as it actually involved in litigation, both of the pipelines I've been involved with have been in Pennsylvania. And I'll talk to you a little bit um, shortly about one of the federal pipelines. Okay. Uh, and I also was involved in uh, with, a, with a proceeding with respect to the Laser Marsalis pipeline, both in Pennsylvania and then um, at least on a commenting basis up here in New York. And I, so I want to just very briefly talk a little bit about, um, I, I'm going to be focusing on the federal pipelines, but if you do have any questions about my experience with the, the state process, either in New York or in Pennsylvania, I'm happy to ask the, answer those questions later. Um, the The taxonomy that you saw earlier of uh, the transmission, the gathering, and the distribution lines is one that uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission does use. People typically think of the lines that are subject to the jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which I am going to call FERC from now on, because it's much too much to have to say every single time, um, as the interstate pipelines. But in fact, uh, there can be federally regulated pipelines that are not interstate, they are within a single state, and there can be interstate pipelines that are not regulated federally. So for example, a good, a good example of that is the Laser Marcellus pipeline. It ran for 30 miles, about 20 miles in Pennsylvania, and just under 10 in New York. And, um, but it, was, it got a determination from, the, uh, from FERC that it was a gathering line not a transmission line, and therefore it became subject to the state level regulatory agencies in the two different states. So there was a separate process in Pennsylvania and, a, and another one in New York instead of having a unified uh, process for the, the pipeline uh, that was done by the federal agency. The interest, an example of an intrastate federally regulated pipeline is one that I'm uh, involved in right now. It's called the Mark I pipeline. It's uh, about 39 miles long. It runs through three counties in Pennsylvania, um, severs for the first time the, the county of Sullivan County, which um, had until the building of this pipeline been relatively undisturbed for about a good 20 mile swath across its middle. Um, this pipeline is connecting up to federally regulated transmission lines, and because it is going to be capable of transmitting gas bi-directionally in either direction between the two federal pipelines that are running east-west, it is deemed to be federally regulated. It will also serve as a gathering system, um, meaning that there will be wells that will ultimately connect to it if it is um, built. But it is uh, federally regulated as a transmission line because it is going to be transmitting or capable of transmitting gas between two other federally regulated lines in either direction. Uh, so the process at FERC is not that dissimilar from what you've heard, um, but I want to talk to you a, a little bit more about it because I found it to be actually a, a much more um, arcane and complicated and exclusive act process than the one in New York. Um, the way that it begins uh, in, in the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, typically is with an application for a certificate of public need and convenience. The pipeline company comes in and asks for this particular type of license for its pipeline. And it will, um, with that application, uh, submit a series of what are known as resource reports. The resource reports are needed um, because as a federally licensed project, the um, pipeline is subject to the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. 
So it will undergo an, an, a federal environmental review rather than a state environmental review. And um, these resource reports are um, studies that are conducted by the pipeline company itself um, with the help of various environmental consultants on a wide range of resource impacts. Water impacts, wildlife impacts, vegetation impacts, noise, air, uh, climate, um, you name it, you know, soup to nuts. And that's, of course, because pipelines affect everything from soup to nuts. And um, the application goes in. It is noticed in the Federal Register. It's typically also noticed in some kind of a, a, a publication in the, um, in the area. And then you have 30 days from the time that the application goes in to intervene as a party in the case. If you put in your application for intervention, put in your papers for intervention, at in, within that 30-day period, and no one objects to your being a party, then you get in automatically. And once you are in, as with New York State, there is a uh, electronic system. You are signed up. You will automatically get in your email uh, every single document that's filed. You will also have responsibilities. If you file anything, then you must serve all of the parties who are on the service list. And some of them may be signed up for electronic filing, and some of them may not be signed up for electronic filing. And so if they are not, then you have to serve them by paper. So there are both you know, uh, benefits and responsibilities of being a party. Uh, if you miss your 30-day deadline, there, it, it, which is evidently extremely common, not surprisingly, since you don't even find out about it probably until your 30 days have passed, um, then you can apply for what's known as late intervention. And you have, there are certain criteria, and it's, it's so common that there are actually rules for this. Um, and you put in your application uh, to be an intervener, and, uh, if, and the other side can object or not. In our experience, um, when Earth Justice moved to intervene, the other side, not too surprisingly, objected. And as a result, we actually did not hear whether or not we were going to be permitted to intervene until FERC made its decision on the pipeline. So it held on to our motion to intervene from December through November the following year. And during that entire time, we had to participate as if we were parties, or we would waive all of our rights. But we didn't know whether or not we would be able to intervene until they actually made the decision. So that is not the common practice in most, place, in most courts or in most agencies. Um, FERC does not make things easy for you to participate. Now, you can participate as a non-party, and you can participate in the environmental process. And that is much simpler. You can just send in your comments. Um, there's, in the environmental process, you go through several stages, typically. Um, the first one is there will be a notice that there's going to be some kind of an environmental review. Um, if it's a relatively small pipeline, um, a 40-mile pipeline is a relatively small pipeline in FERC, by FERC standards, typically what they will do is prepare an environmental assessment, which is supposed to be a relatively short-form environmental review of the impacts to determine whether or not this particular pipeline will have a significant impact on the environment. If it does have a significant impact on the environment, then FERC is required to do an, a full-fledged environmental impact statement. Typically, in my experience, when they do an environmental assessment, they determine that there will be no significant impact, and all they do is the environmental assessment. Um, when they'll notice the environmental review, there's often a public hearing. That's often the first time anybody hears about this pipeline. By that time, 30 days has already passed. There, there's also scoping sessions um, to meet with the agency or to submit comments to the agency about what you think the environmental review should cover. And so, for example, one of the things that we asked for in the scoping session for the Mark 1 pipeline was that there be a comprehensive cumulative impact analysis for the pipeline that would take into account the background of Marcellus Shale gas development onto which this pipeline was going to be overlain. 
And there were a variety of other requests from a variety of other things, including us, and we asked for a variety of other things as well. But our biggest concern in Pennsylvania was that there be a cumulative impact analysis because unlike New York, P Pennsylvania does not have a state environmental review law. So absolutely nobody is looking cumulatively at the impacts in New York from pipelines or shale gas development or compressor stations or anything. So as, as challenged as we find ourselves here in New York, we are way ahead of the game in that respect. And in, uh, so we they, you have the scoping session, the agency decides what the scope of its environmental review will, will be, and then it undertakes its environmental review. And that is in large part uh, done by reviewing the resource reports that are submitted by uh, the company and any other comments that may come in on the project. And we were told essentially that we should just send in whatever we have and um, hope that the agency would take a look at it. Maybe it would make a difference, maybe it would not make a difference. Um, and we noticed that there would be, we would submit comments and often as a result of that, FERC would be sending out what are known as environmental data requests to the pipeline. So we would send in something saying, uh, by the way, do, do you know that this is likely to fragment forest and affect migratory birds? And then there would be a data request, could you please tell us, you know, which birds are likely to be in the path of this project? Um, you know, where they occur along the pipeline length and so forth. So you can, you can sometimes see this, but you never get any direct response at all from the agency. Um, the, when the uh, agency has finished its uh, environmental assessment, if there's been enough interest shown, there will be typically a comment period after it's released. They are not required to have a comment period, but if there's been Public interest, typically they will do that. In the Mark 1 pipeline case, for example, they did do a public review. It's another opportunity to comment on the draft of the environmental assessment, see what they've left out, see what they've done halfway, um, see you know, w what else could be done better. And th those comments will go in. There'll be typically a 30-day comment period. There might be a slightly longer one if one of the fed other federal agencies asks for it, for example. And then they take the, the, the commission takes that under advisement and decides, with, with the environmental assessment will be a recommendation as to whether or not there is a significant impact. Um, so if there's a finding of no, recommended finding of no significant impact, known as a FONSI, then um, it'll go to, the, uh, to the, uh, a, the commission. The commission will examine the environmental assessment. They'll look at the various comments that have been made and then they will draft an order and they will either adopt the environmental assessment or they will adopt it with some modifications. Um, and they will at, you, typically at that time also issue their order, um, deciding whether or not this uh, company is going to get their certificate of public uh, convenience and need, public uh, convenience and necessity. In my experience, I have never known a federal gas transmission line ever to be disapproved by FERC. So typically what you can do is you can help to change the route if there's substantial public pressure there. You can put additional environmental controls on it so it won't be so damaging. But I don't know of anybody who has successfully opposed a pipeline and actually had FERC decide that it is not in the public convenience or necessity because the standard under the, under the federal system effectively is if they have customers, it's in the public interest. So they don't go in until they actually have somebody who says, we're going to use this pipeline. And the, the federal environmental law is a procedural law. It requires that the agency consider seriously, take a hard look at the environmental impacts, but it does not determine any outcome. So it is entirely possible that the agency could say, you know, this is going to cause permanent frag fragmentation of forest, and it could potentially um, displace wildlife in the area, and it could um, interfere with recreational uses, and, but we really need more gas pipelines, and it's in the public interest, and we're going to do it. And that is exactly what has happened so far in the Mark 1 case. 
Um, now, in terms of public involvement, in addition to potentially being a full-fledged party or putting in comments, one of the things that the pipeline application typically does is it provides a chart of all the other types of, of approvals it's going to need before it actually can be um, constructed where they want it to be built. So FERC is not the only one um, licensing or uh, providing an approval for the pipeline. And in fact, they do the environmental review and they grant the ultimate approval for the construction, but they do require that the um, pipeline company satisfy an array of other requirements. So for example, um, if the Department of Environmental Conservation is going to be reviewing stream crossings and erosion and sedimentation control programs and so forth, FERC will typically say, you know, you have to develop your erosion and sedimentation control plan in conjunction with DEC, and that, that approved plan will be assumed to mitigate all of the impacts down to the level of insignificance, and that's the way that they generate the FONSI. But there will be, in most cases, particularly the federal pipeline that's going some considerable distance, you know, in a state like New York, there probably will be issues um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service over potentially endangered species. There will be potentially issues with the Army Corps of Engineers if they're going over um, federally, federal jurisdictional wetlands, for example, or they're going across a major water of the United States. Um, some of these things are sometimes delegated to the state agency, and they work in tandem. Um, the, the Army Corps um, permits are often done by the state. But the Fish and Wildlife Service administers the Migratory uh, Bird Treaty Act and the Endangered Species Act. Um, and the Endangered Species Act can be a real, you know, that could potentially be something that would actually stop the pipeline. Um, or at least it would require them to go a f through a much more substantial um, process to um, ask for a permit for what's called take of an endangered species, which just means the right to kill it. Um, and uh, there are endangered species in, in New York. Um, we have uh, endangered bats. We have endangered amphibians. We have endangered reptiles. Unfortunately, we don't have too many of the charismatic megafauna left in this area. Um, but they will have to do a study. And you can have an influence there. And in, with all of these other um, agencies, you can have an influence on the environmental review of the federal pipeline. And one of the things that I learned in my first foray into FERC is that it really pays to understand what all of those permits are and to get involved in the permitting process with every single one of them. And that is a big investment of energy. So if you think you might want to um, weigh in on a pipeline, you really need a team of people to work on it. It's going to be an extremely challenging thing to do as an individual. Um, but you certainly can be in a position to help get better controls from the state and local agencies that take a look at the, at the federal pipeline if you're involved in watching and you're um, doing your freedom of information requests and you're doing a review of the files and you're you know, um, making sure that they're doing the, the good thing. Now, I will tell you that I actually think that here in New York, for the most part, the Department of Public Service does a better job than FERC. And even in the laser pipeline case, which was one of those medium-sized ones that squeaked in by going only 9.82 miles instead of 10, there were a, a long list of um, conditions on the uh, certificate that it received um, that we actually sent to FERC as an example of what they ought to be doing with their federal pipeline. So again, there's obviously going to always be room for improvement on the gathering line systems with the Department of Public Service. Um, but we, you know, we, we are working with an agency that um, is taking its job seriously. And uh, obviously they will take it more seriously if they know that the public is watching them. And I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, but um, but there, there, there are you know, meaningful controls that are being put on by the, by the state. Um, I would say they're less meaningful from the perspective of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission because what it basically does is punt to the state agencies or the local agencies. And it often does that before it even sees what the plan is or it has only a draft of the plan. And it just assumes that everything will be okay. 
and that whatever the agency comes up with will be fine. And um, so just to full disclosure, we are in litigation over this pipeline right now because they declined to do the cumulative impact analysis for the Marcellus Shale. They're actually just examining this um, cumulatively, but without looking at the gas development. Um, they're only looking at it in the context of other federal pipelines. And um, we are also um, arguing that their mitigation um, is inadequate, largely because what they are doing is just saying, um, you know, we are going to take it on faith that what is going to be developed will be good enough, even though there's evidence in the record that, d that in Pennsylvania they're really not doing a very good job, that the mitigation measures aren't working, and that they're wildly polluting their headwater streams in the, con the context of federal energy regulatory um, review. So I'll stop here, and I'm happy to answer questions later um, more about the process if you have any for me.